Today we are beginning our new sermon series on the gospel according to Luke. And we're, we, we will be turning to the first verses, what's known as the preface or the prologue of Luke's gospel in a few minutes, but we're not going to start there. Um, today's sermon is titled, Be Certain. And I just draw your attention again to these odd things that I've added to the pulpit today. Be certain. Now, you know, Christmas time, any time, but certainly Christmas time, it's really important that you get a gift. And when I say get a gift, I don't mean receive a gift. You know, it's not just that you receive a gift. You need to get in the idea of understanding and turning around and actually using properly the gift. If I had a son who needed to go get a job, a part-time job, and work his way through college, but let's say for, for whatever reason I was able to give to him a, a vehicle, an automobile or a truck, and I, I gave him this truck or this car, but, but all he did with the truck or car is he parked it in his driveway because he saw other people did that and he thought that looks kind of cool. And on hot days, he might get underneath the car because it provides really good shade. And on other days, he noticed that the seats are very comfortable so he would go and take a nap, but he never turned the ignition and never actually drove the vehicle anywhere. He wouldn't get the gift, would he? Well, you could say, well, okay, let's, let's, let's not be that crazy pastor. Let's assume he actually drives the vehicle around, but then let's say this. Instead of actually ever actually going and getting a job or going to school, he starts going out to bars and places all over town and doing drug deals with the vehicle. Did he get the gift the way I intended to give it to him? No, he did not get the gift. Um, if, if he, let's say he enrolls in school. Let's say I even pay for his first semester. Now, Tabor and Jackie, I'm sure this would never actually happen, but let's say he doesn't actually drive to Mississippi State and actually attend his classes, and then I find out, well, he never used the vehicle to even get there, even though he kind of pulled the, you know, he didn't get the gift, he abused the gift. Um, it's really important that you get a gift. You know, if uh, my mom gave this scratch pad to her cats, but all they want to do is sleep on the scratch pad, they're not scratching. It's a really important for a child, for a middle-aged person, for whatever, you to get the gift, particularly if it's an important gift. Now, I've got a few keys for you on getting a gift. They're in your sermon notes, and I think we'll probably show them up on the screen as well today. Keys to getting, understanding, and actually using appropriately a gift. Uh, Point of reference, who, in other words, who gives the gift? Who's the donor? That's going to be a, provide a real insight. Again, if, if the drug dealer gives my son a car, that's a different, you know, we're probably talking about a different agenda going on than if I give my son the car. Who, who's the giver? Uh, we got a blank space there. We'll have to come back to that. I don't know what that is. We'll, we'll come back to that. Then we go to to whom, to whom the gift is given. That's an important clue and key to understanding a gift. Um, and then the why question. And you can see I've got something I'm going to highlight there, the blank blank. The why leads to a blank blank, okay? So who? Again, the giver. What? That's, that's what goes in that next blank. What is the gift? You know, understanding what the gift is. To whom it is given. And why, for what purpose, which is the so that. Write that in. And can you all say that with me? The so that. I give you this gift so that you can use it in this way, so that you can achieve this goal. Okay? The so that. Today, we're going to begin with, before we even turn specifically to Luke's gospel, talk about the Bible. Now, the Bible is an out of this world gift. It really is an out-of-this-world gift. It's the best gift you could possibly receive in a tangible way, in a tangible way, on, on this earth. And let's think about the Bible remembering our keys to getting a gift. Let's say I gave my children a Bible. Well, wonder what you should do with this Bible. Let's say you received gifts. Some people will say, well, yeah, sure, I've got 80 Bibles. I mean, I've been given Bibles right and left. And my question would be, okay, did you get the gift? <laughs> Did you actually get the gift? Uh, so let's remember who, what, to whom, 
and the why, which is, in other words, we're asking the question, so that. Remember this? So that. Um, 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17, probably the best known couple of verses on what the Bible is, what it does. Um, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture, this means the whole Bible, okay? Uh, Paul's talking about the what we would call the Old Testament or the Hebrew scriptures, but it, it's understood in general Christian interpretation. This applies to the New Testament too for us because it's canonical scripture. All scripture is breathed out by God. So who's our giver? Who's our ultimate giver? God, right? God breathes out the scripture. God inspired the scripture and is profitable this is getting into our what thing. We know it's all scripture. Well, what is it? What's it like? Is profitable for teaching, for reproof, or you could say conviction. That would be another way to translate that word that's there. For correction, for training in righteousness. So all four of those things. Paul's really specific about this. But now we get to where the rubber hits the road. I've got you queued up for this. So what do you think the next words that Paul has? In the Greek, it's one word. It's, it's henna. Henna. You see this over and over again in the New Testament, particularly pertaining to Scripture, okay? Henna. So that, so that what? Wonder what the answer is going to be. Why have we been given the Bible? Why have we been given Scripture? We know it, it serves the purposes of, you know, reproof and teaching and equip. Okay, what's it going to? What is God's goal with this? So that the man or the person of God, there's our to whom answer right there. Do you see that? It's given, not just generally, it's not just a shotgun gift, okay? It's given specifically so that the man or the person of God, now I say person because anthropos is the, is the Greek term there, and it can be translated specifically man, but it also means like humanity, okay? So it means women or men, okay? The person, the woman or man of God, in other words, somebody who's a believer that belongs to God, well, that, they, that they may be blank and blank, for every blank blank. Okay, what, what's going on here? God has breathed this. God has given this to us so the person of God uh, can receive this scripture. It's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. Those are pretty big, you know, uh, directives there. But what is the ultimate goal? The chief end of the gift of the Bible. What does God want you to do with the Bible? Well, you could say, I know what to do with this Bible. It's a great paperweight. I, I put it on top of other stuff I need to hold down. Is that what the gift, did I get the gift? Well, I know what this is. There's a few verses in here. I know this is a big book and I'm, I really don't have time for most of this book, but there's three or four verses in here that I read sometimes to make me feel better. That's why God gave this. So, so I could pick out three or four verses that I personally like to make me feel better. Is that, do you think that's what the Bible's gonna say it's there for? What do you think? No, actually, no. Um, God, the goal is this, so that the person of God, so that you may be complete, not part, <laughs> not partial, not incomplete, so that you may be complete. In other words, as a person of God, fully grounded in the faith, knowing what the word is, right? Okay, so that you may be complete. Well, what does that mean to be complete? What's it gonna lead to? equipped so that you may be equipped. Wait a minute. That means I may need to be equipped to do stuff. You mean it's not just here for me to hold as a paperweight or occasionally open up for a couple of verses? No, no, no. So that you may be complete and equipped for what? Guess what? Equipped for every good work. A few good works? Occasionally if I feel like it? No, for every good work. You may remember Paul also in Ephesians 2 says we're saved by grace, um, not by works so that no one could boast. Um, so that we will do the good works that God prepared in advance for us to do. Y'all remember this? You're God's workmanship prepared to do good works, which God prepared in advance for you. Okay, so you are equipped by the scripture to actually follow through on what the Bible is talking about, living out a Christian life. Are you interested in, that's the person of God, you want to expand it out to a household? Well, I've got another uh, so that kind of passage for you from the Old Testament. 
What is the Torah, the law, therefore, the first five books of the Bible? What's the law, therefore? Well, in um, Deuteronomy 29, 29, um, so that we can get the Torah, Moses says this, the secret things or the covered things belong to the Lord our God, but the things uncovered, the things revealed, in other words, what God has given us and told his people, the things revealed, uh, belong to us and to our children. Did you hear that? To us and to our children forever. So that there's the, so that in, in the Hebrew, it's just a lamed before the asot word, which means to do. Okay, so in other words, so that we will do, so that we will actually do what's in here. <laughs> that's, that's what it's saying. Now notice this. Families are actually supposed to read the Bible together and do what the Bible says. Parents, are you reading the Bible with your, your children? Let me encourage you. As, as we move through Christmas and head into a new year, family Bible time together is key. And I'm going to tell you this later too, and I'll keep repeating it all through the next year. Luke is really a good narrative to read with children and definitely teenagers of all ages. Okay, it's, it's, it's the best written, some of the best written scripture, and it's narrative. It's a story. It has a beginning and end, a plot development, all kinds of stuff going on in Luke. Okay, so uh, to read together so that we will actually do what it says. That's Deuteronomy 29, 29. Well, let's go back to the New Testament and to one of the Gospels. John, as well as Luke, we're about to get to Luke, but John, as well as Luke, explicitly tell us why they wrote their Gospels. Now, that's a treasure just to have that, to, to know why these Gospels were written, okay? Let's go to John first. John 20, verse 31, and then we're going to get to 32. That's where our henna is, our so that is going to be. Um, now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which were not written in this book, but these are written. So in other words, John is saying, I'm, I'm telling you about these signs and I'm covering what I covered in my gospel. Written so that, do you see that? There's the henna again, there's the so that, okay? Everybody see that? Okay, let's see why John wrote this. So that, and in fact, with John, we're gonna get two hennas. So we're gonna get a penultimate so that and an ultimate so that. Let's look at the way these go together. Written so that you may Wonder what? That Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. And so that by believing you may something, something his name. How does John fill those in? Well, let's look at this. Written so that you may believe. The gospel of John is written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. It's not there for just kind of inspirational encouragement. It is so flat out that you can believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. That's the penultimate so that. Where's that going to? What's the end goal of this that you believe? So that you may have life. And that means life that is with God, in God, from God. In other words, eternal life now. You can already live with God. You can actually not be dead spiritually, but be alive with God through Jesus now and into eternity. When you are dust in the ground, you will still be alive if you believe in Jesus. And John says, this is why I'm writing this gospel. This is why God inspired me and led me to write this gospel. So that's John. Now let's go to Luke. And remember our keys, you know, the who, the who, to whom, the what is it, and what is the end goal? What is the so that? Listen for this as we hear God's word from the opening, the, the preface, the prologue of Luke's gospel. And this is a preface that is unique in the New Testament. It's fully orbed. He tells you his methodology, Luke does, and why he's writing this flat out at the beginning of the book. Hear God's word. Inasmuch... That's a highfalutin Greek word that only Luke uses, and it's only here. He's in a high style right now when he opens his gospel. High style, major, cultured, educated guy here in the Greco-Roman world. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished or literally fulfilled among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers or servants of the word have delivered them to us. That's part one. 
Now let's go to part two, verses three and four. It seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you. Here's the what, and here's the to whom. Most excellent, that's the way you address somebody who's a high authority figure, okay, somebody who's above you, politically or socially. Most excellent Theophilus. So that, there's our henna right there, verse 4. Here it comes. So that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. Okay, let's unpack this a little bit more. We're going to go to the to whom and the why. As you can hear, I'm already emphasizing really the why heavily. So let's go to that. Write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. The so that. Now, sometimes with the Greek New Testament, the word order gets overemphasized, but in this case, and with the preface, and as skilled as Luke is, he's the most skilled Greek writer in the entire New Testament, I mean, hands down. Um, I think his word order here is important, and the very closing word of this entire preface is, in fact, certainty. I know it's not the way the ESV is translating it for you, but the last word in the entire preface, why I wrote this, is so that you can have certainty, firmness, um, so that you may know concerning the words or the things, the logon, uh, you were taught, you were taught. That word, let me go ahead and highlight that one for you too. Kate kethes. That's the word there. You actually know more Greek than you think you do. What do we use a lot of times in worship? Catechetical statements, right? These are things that you hear and are supposed to repeat and hear audibly and supposed to repeat over and over again so that you learn them. That's what catechisms are. Okay, hear that? So Luke is telling the person to whom he's writing, you've been catechized in this, you've heard it audibly, you've read it, you've been drilled on it, now I want you to have certainty. In other words, you've been given the basics of the Christian faith, now I want to flesh it out for you. You, you've believed that Jesus is the Son of God, that he was born in the flesh, that he died for our sins on the cross. Now let me flesh out what that means and what actually happened and some of the people that were involved and the way Jesus taught, filling in the blanks and the gaps for you. Okay? It's like you've got the creedal knowledge and the catechetical knowledge. Now I'm going to give you the whole story. That's what Luke just said. And why is he doing this? Why is Luke doing this? Well, this gets us back to why, Pastor, these are not lumps of coal for bad children that I'm going to hand out, you know, via Santa Claus. What, did anybody know what this is? Well, let me go to that word, the word that closes out the preface. Asphalion. That's the Greek. That's the Greek. You can say, I don't know that word. And I'm going to say, yes, you do. What is this that I have up here, right here? What is it? Asphalt. We get that word from this word that closes out Luke's preface. Okay, so in Greek, a negative is indicated oftentimes by the simple letter alpha. Okay, and then you, and so in other words, if you put an alpha in front of theists or people who believe in God. Are you with me? Theist or an atheist, an atheist is somebody who does not believe in God, right? Um, so, svalo means firmness, okay? Asphalo means firmness. Svalo itself, by itself, means by being tripped up. Asphalo means firmness. So, and we actually, I think, I think maybe fall potentially comes from swallow. So, in other words, so that you will not fall. So that you will not fall, so that you won't get tripped up. Yeah, can we go to that? I think, I think we've got it. 
So, um, yeah, so that you will not fall. This is what Luke is writing his gospel for. Now, that's not just for Theophilus. He's writing it through to a patron who's apparently financing this, helping him distribute it. But it's for other disciples too, and it's for you. In other words, the Bible, and this is the inspired word of God, is saying God doesn't want us to trip up. God wants us to be firm in our faith. And what's a key to that? Actually reading the Bible and specifically Luke and his second volume, Acts, are key to actually knowing who Jesus is and not losing Jesus in all the pressures of life. That's what the Gospel of Luke tells us as we open. So, so that you will not, ah, let's follow, fall or trip up. You will be firm, secure in your faith. Now, to whom? The gospel, according to Luke, and its sequel or the second volume of the same work, uh, the Acts of the Apostles, are each addressed to. You, if you look at, if you open up Acts chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, addressed also to this patron, Theophilus. Who is Theophilus? We don't actually know. The name means lover of God, or it can mean can be translated somebody who's loved by God. Maybe it means both. Uh, looks like a high official. Could be this can be an actual name, but but he's a representative of people who are educated, probably Gentile disciples who are coming to faith and need to be informed about how Jesus fulfills all the Old Testament and what Jesus is like and what the early church is like and how even though. Uh, this is the Jewish Messiah. He's good for Gentiles. Gentiles are all in. And by the way, even though a lot of Jews are not believing, and even though the Roman Empire is starting to get nervous about the Christians and this movement, it's all good. So you can have firmness in your faith, Theophilus, and for the rest of us too. Um, who? Ultimately, it's from God, of course. First and last, it's from God. But notice it comes via eyewitnesses, and servants or ministers of the word. This is really important for you to know to have security in your faith. Most religions have so-called scriptures that come from mystics or people who have an insight, okay? Like Buddhism. I mean, the, the great insights uh, of, of the Buddha. I mean, that's awesome, but that's just like a mystic coming up with things, okay? Uh, Muhammad supposedly being told directly by God just kind of speaking him to his ear like he's a robot writing this. Uh, the golden plates of the Mormons. Hey, love Mormons, but that is a different faith. That is a different... Okay. The, Joseph Smith finding these golden plates in a cave. That's not what we're told about the New Testament. The New Testament is very clear. These are people who are sweating and living and dying for their faith through many years, researching publicly putting all this out. I mean, referring to specifically named eyewitnesses in specific locations while other people who may want to dispute this are alive, while people who are persecuting the Christian church can persecute the Christian church and say, do you recant? Do you renounce what you said? You're listed as an eyewitness in Luke's account. Do you want to recant now before we cut off your head? I mean, this is live stuff going on for a number of years in the first century. This is what our scripture is. Our scripture came to a whole process of eyewitnesses who were subject to persecution, um, cross-examination, trials, everything else. And people can say, no, this isn't true. And Luke is really putting this all out on the table. That's what he's just told you. I've extensively researched this. I've studied this. I've examined and spoken with eyewitnesses, women and men. By the way, I'm pretty convinced, including Mary, the mother of Jesus. Luke just has insights nobody else gets close to with Mary. And now, just as the eyewitnesses and the ministers of the word delivered, so also I'm going to deliver to you. Notice that word delivered. They delivered. This is the term that Paul himself uses when he says, for I received what I also delivered unto you, that Jesus Christ, you know, was born in the flesh, died on the cross, was raised. That's 1 Corinthians 15. Um, for I delivered to you that which I also received that on the night when Jesus was betrayed, he broke bread. Remember this? 1 Corinthians, Paul is using that same paradidomy term there that Luke uses here with these eyewitnesses. In other words, these people are stewards entrusted with the truth and they hand it on to the church and it's open public. 
subject to hostility and persecution, but they are delivering it faithfully. I mean, this is an awesome, this, this is a treasure beyond imagination, what we have here. It's incredible. Um, so anyway, who, who wrote this? Um, I'm fairly convinced, or I, I would say I'm basically convinced that it is Luke, the traditional, you know, attributed author. Internally, he's, he does not identify himself. He doesn't say, I, Luke, write this to you, most excellent Theophilus. However, you know, in the early church, in the second century, for instance, the earliest witnesses we have, the Muratorian canon from the second century, in other words, the 100s, okay, from around 170, identifies, it's, it's the oldest extant list of the canonical New Testament has 22, I think, of the 27 books in the New Testament. It speci he specifically lists Luke, the physician, as the author of the third gospel. Irenaeus, uh, Bishop of Lyon in the middle 100s, you know, middle second century to the late second century. Irenaeus also identifies Luke as the author of the third gospel. The oldest papyrus we have, manuscript of the gospel, the third gospel, papyrus number 75, discovered about a century ago, it, it says Katalukan as the title, which means according to Luke. Uh, you go into the, thir uh, the third century origin and on after that, you know, Eusebius, the earliest Christian historian, they all unanimously identify the third gospel as Luke's. Is it an essential of the faith? Is it like part of the Apostles' Creed? No. Do I live and die on it? No but I'm gonna read this, and so you're gonna hear me referring to Luke a lot. Luke is identified in Paul's um, letters as a physician who has hit through thick and thin his associate. When you get to Acts, you have the famous we passages of Acts 16, and then sprinkled all from Acts 20 through 28 through the close of the Acts of the Apostles. Whoever this is is writing this is with Paul, including for years in Jerusalem when Paul is arrested there, and then when Paul is in Caesarea Maritima over on the coast for two years, you could ask, when did Luke have all this time to interview all these eyewitnesses who were there in the time of Jesus, including apparently Jesus' own mother, Mary, to get her thoughts and details on the nativity that no other gospel writer has? Well, man, Luke was in uh, Palestine for three years while Paul was arrested and waiting to be transferred to Rome. That's how among other times. So what does this mean? Well, this is the thing that really struck me. Luke's gospel is really into the fact that the gospel of the Jewish Messiah is for all people, for all Gentiles all over the world. He's the savior of the world. Guess what? Luke, the author, according to what we read from Colossians, it's, it's clear because Paul refers to some circumcised co-workers and then those who are not circumcised. Luke is a Gentile. You can brush over that really fast, but let me explain that what do you, that means. That means to fill in the blank, who wrote more of the New Testament than anybody else? A Gentile. I mean, that's staggering. This is the gospel and the New Testament of the Jewish Messiah written in the first century. These books are written in the first century. A Jewish Messiah movement and the most prolific writer of the entire thing is Luke a Gentile? Because when you put Luke and Acts together, it's 27.5% of the entire New Testament, over a quarter of the New Testament. Paul, you asked about Paul, 22%. Luke wrote more that's in the New Testament than Paul. And the longest of the four Gospels is by Luke, a Gentile, apparently a Gentile, convert to the faith. It's amazing. And what is it? It's an orderly account, Luke tells us, of God's gospel. This is my interpretation, okay? Of God's gospel of salvation in Jesus for all nations, for all the Gentiles, as well as the Jews, via his church, which is the people of God. The church is the people of God. In other words, no longer just Israel, no longer just Jews, but also Gentiles are brought into the people of God. That is the message that God has to bring us through the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we'll come back to this next week of the events that have been fulfilled. We'll talk about what that means among us. Some highlights to close out to get you encouraged on Luke. 
read through Luke and Acts while we're doing this series over the next who knows how long, right? Luke, Luke and Acts. The New Testament's best Greek writing by far, okay? No question about it. Most complex, it can range from high-level academic type writing at the beginning to popular writing to all these Aramaisms that are uh, transliterated into Greek all over the place. Um, it's the most his detailed historiography by far in the, in the entire New Testament. You want to know names and places? Luke, I mean, his numbers are through the roof compared to everybody else. He's telling you people's names right and left all over the place, where they're from, who they are. And by the way, if you want to go question them about did this really happen, feel free to here in the first century. That's what Luke is saying. He is, uh, do we have any women among us? But he is by far the most consistent in highlighting women their faith and their testimonies. In fact, Luke almost pro pro programmatically sometimes goes from a man story to a woman story. And back and forth all the time. Um, this is the, the gospel with the sweetest hymns in the entire New Testament. All, most of what we sing, you know, around Christmas that plays in scripture, more than half of it will be from Luke. Okay, and all those hymns or canticles that he includes, you know, the Magnificat, uh, the Nuke de Menace, all that. Okay, um, do, you, do you like parables? Ever heard of the parable of the Good Samaritan? Ever heard of the parable of the Prodigal Son? Where would I find those parables? In all four Gospels? No. In two of the Gospels? Three of the Gospels? No, one Gospel. Which one is it? Guess. Luke. Parable of the Persistent Widow? Luke. You interested in Zacchaeus? You ever taught your children about Zacchaeus? Well, he's obviously in all four Gospels, isn't he? Zacchaeus, you know, the tax collector? No, he's in one Gospel. Luke. Mary's details that we get into around Christmas time, the shepherds, the angels, they're in all four Gospels, right? One. Luke. Mary pondering these things in her heart, all four Gospels? One. Luke. Jesus at 12 in the temple, all four Gospels? No, Luke, because Mary knew about it, right? Be certain. Be certain in the faith that has been delivered to you. How? Well, centrally, read the treasure that has been given to us, including at the heart of the matter, Luke and Acts. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this sermon from First Presbyterian Church in Starkville, Mississippi. If you want to find out more about our church and our ministries, please visit fpcstarkville.org. If you'd like someone to reach out to you and uh, maybe grab coffee or lunch to get to know us a little bit better, you can go to fpcstarkville.org slash connect and fill out the form there. And if you like what you're doing and want to see more, uh, go to fpcstarkville.org slash give to give.